welcome you to the Graduate Center Digital Showcase. Uh, it's an annual event that showcases the high caliber of digitally inflected teaching and research performed by students, faculty, and staff across the Graduate Center. And this is my first one, so I'm really excited. Uh, the Graduate Center is committed to fostering thoughtful, creative, and critical uses of technology as we think about how graduate education is changing in the 21st century. Uh, it's really essential that we prepare students to incorporate technology into their work in substantive ways. And as you know, that work has taken on, taken on heightened importance over the past year. Uh, we've had to find new ways to teach, to carry out, carry out research, and to network. So the presentations you will see today demonstrate our, our collective effort to build a community of practice around that digital work, sharing ideas and building skills together. Uh, the Graduate Center helps build community in many ways uh, through the fellowship programs that offer our students opportunities to share knowledge with one another and the wider, wider Graduate Center community uh, through workshops, consultations and events like this. Uh, through grant programs that offer funding to students as they build out their digital projects. And of course, by creating new master's degree programs, such as our MA in Digital Humanities, the MS in Data Analysis and Visualization, the MS in Data Science, and the MS in Quantitative Methods in the Social Sciences, each of which allow our students to develop new skills in a classroom setting. Our digital programs are nationally and internationally known and have been supported by grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, among others. So thank you very much for joining us today. Please enjoy the many great presentations we are about to hear. Back to you, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank President Gorel for her introduction, but also um, just to thank the administration of the Grad Center as a whole for its strong support of digital scholarship. It means so much to us to work with a forward thinking administration that places a strong value on thinking ahead and anticipating future directions in the academy. In particular, I want to thank Robin, who has had the courage to join us in New York City in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and who we know so many members of the Graduate Center community are looking forward to meeting in person soon in the coming months after having had so many Zoom greetings. You too. Uh, I'd, also, <laughs> I'd also like to thank interim provost Julia Wrigley, whose interest in quantitative scholarship has been a boon to our work. Associate provost David Olin, who takes time to explore work and who has been a steadfast believer in it. And dean for the sciences, Josh Brumberg, who is always supportive of GC Digital Initiatives and who has been a real partner in helping us reach science faculty and graduate students. I'd also like to thank the members of the Provost Office and Office of Student Affairs who do so much to help our programs move forward. Margarita Bazan and Ellis, Rosa Maldonado, Stephen Wong and Phyllis Schultz. And I'd like to thank our frequent collaborators, Luke Walter of the Teaching and Learning Center, Steve Zweibel, Emily Drabinsky, Jill Siracella, Roxanne Shirazi, and Elvis Batakaitis of the Min Minneries Library. Michael Manderberg, Carlos Hernandez, and Julie Fuller of the Interactive Technology and Pedagogy, Pedagogy Program. Our work with you and with so many colleagues at the GC enriches everything we do. I'd also like to thank our open educational technologists, Lori Herson and Robin Miller, as well as the CUNY Academic Commons team members, Scott Voth, Marilyn Weber, Anthony Wheeler, and Boone Gerges. Finally, I would like to thank the amazing staff of GC Digital Initiatives. MA, MS Advising Fellows, Mickey Kaufman and Javier Otero Pena, MA, MS Program Coordinator, Jason Nielsen, Manifold Fellow, Wendy Borales, GCDI Coordinator, Jesse McCormack, DHRI Coordinator, Kali Westerling, our Program Social Media Fellows, Beth Farah, Maya Rose, Parissa Setayash, Seyoung Sage Yim, and B Stone. Um, the Program Social Media Fellows do so much to get the word out about the work of the Graduate Center students and faculty through social media. Finally, I would like to thank the GC Digital Fellows. And Param, could you please advance the slide? Um, so our fellows are Param Ajmira, Rafa Davis Portello, Olivia Ildofonso, D. Jung, Filippa Collado, Connor French, Stefano Morello, and Yu Zhao Luau, who do 
they the digital fellows so many of you who are on this um on this call today and at this event know the work that the digital fellows do uh, they are such talented graduate students they foster digital scholarship they do it in a way that emphasizes community and support um, and they have so much enthusiasm and so much expertise to share our, our students are so lucky to work with them and over the last year they've done amazing things uh, to pivot their work during the pandemic and to think about how to run events like the Digital Research Institute uh, remotely. Um, I want to send particular thanks to our outgoing fellows, Olivia, Stefano, Felipe, and Rafa, who have just been treasures uh, to have with us. I would also like to thank Lisa Rohde, whose work with the GC Digital Fellows, Program Social Media Fellows, and Digital Research Institute shows such care, such expert planning, and such thoughtfulness. Lisa's tireless work and desire to do good in the world are inspiring. It is such a pleasure to work with her and I am so happy that the GC community benefits on a daily basis from her presence. Finally, this is the real, the real finally, um, I want to thank Steve Breyer, who if some of you may know is beginning the retirement process after this semester. Um, we will have a, a proper uh, celebration of Steve's work next spring um, when we hope to do it in person. But I just want to say that Steve started so much of what you will see and hear today. Um, his humor, his care, his focus on digital pedagogy, and his fierce dedication to the ideals and mission of CUNY animate so much of what we do. And with that, I am happy to introduce Brett Maney, um, who is a faculty member in the MA program in Digital Humanities, and who has taught the Digital Praxis class uh, in that program this semester, and he'll be introducing the Digital Praxis presentations. All right, thank you, Matt and President Gorel, and apologies for any snuffling or sniffling uh, you hear from me tonight, uh, battling allergies. The DH Praxis Seminar, whose project presentations I'm introducing, um, is a two semester course that serves as the centerpiece of the GC DH program. In the first semester, students learn about the landscape of the digital humanities and write project proposals. In the second semester, they come together in groups to create prototypes of some of those projects over the course of several months. In the process, learning what it takes to put a DH project together. This year, students studied with Matt Gold in the fall. This spring, they worked with me to build five of the projects. Unlike most everything else, I have to say, things went pretty smoothly. We voted, formed teams, and immediately got down to work putting our shoulders to the digital grindstone. While I'm tempted to say much about the five projects we built, you'll hear shortly from the teams themselves. Right now, I just wanna say a word about these students' resilience and esprit de corps during this most improbable of academic years. There are many platitudes that one could say about what it's like to work with and admire a group of people you've never met in person. There are platitudes that bear repeating in 2021. It's remarkable that a class as intensely collaborative as this one, conducted entirely online, has met with such success. I congratulate the students on their commitment, on the social purpose they brought to their work, and on their enviable skills. And I'm excited for you in the audience to hear about these projects this evening. If this kind of work represents the future of the digital humanities, and the future of the digital humanities is rosy. On behalf of the Praxis Seminar, thank you to the many advisors, some listening in here tonight, who helped these projects germinate and grow these past months. I'll now turn things over to the Corona Chronicles team. Hi, everyone. That was just about the nicest introduction that I think we could possibly imagine. So. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be kicking us off and I will get us set up here. All right, there we go. Um, well, welcome everyone. I, my name is Karen DeLay and I am very happy to be presenting on behalf of the Corona Chronicles team. Um, our project is a global digital collection for middle and high school students to share their stories of living through the COVID-19 pandemic and to also be able to view what students in other places have to express about their experiences. We've all been through a lot over the last year and kids have certainly been through a lot as well. 
We'll begin with this quote, which speaks to the real mission behind our project, which is about bearing witness to the experiences of children living through these times, and also about helping them make sense of those experiences. These are some of the many stories that have not been told. Here you see some of the student submissions as they appear on our site, which is hosted through Adobe Portfolio, a platform that we chose for several reasons, including its ease of use for our target audi audience, the technical capacities to display a wide range of media forms, and the specificity of design to display artwork in a professional manner. Within the landscape of digital collections that are documenting the pandemic, our project is distinguished in several ways. And the first is the focus on middle and high school students. Other collections center on youth, um, younger students, college students, adults, or some combination thereof. And this is an age group thus far underrepresented elsewhere. Second is that it's multimedia. Parallel sites tend to choose a single media type, whether that's visual art, video, or writing. Our student co-creators spoke persuasively about the importance of allowing multimedia to ensure the full range of creative expression that reflects their individuality. And the final distinguishing features relate to reach and visibility. There are many community-based archives coming into formation right now, defining their scope through the borders of a town, a city, a university, or some other sort of contained community. And the content of such archives and collections is frequently not public. Among those aimed at students, many are contests that actually display very few of the pieces submitted. Our project stretches across community and regional borders in an open, publicly facing collection. As you hover over each student piece, you'll see the metadata displayed, name, age, and location. And this design choice aims to drive engagement in a very particular way. Students can see that many of their experiences or sentiments are shared by people in different places. I think I got temporarily muted there. So I'll just start from the beginning of this slide, slide which um, the purpose of which is to show that as you hover over the piece, you see the name, age, and location. The design choice here was to drive engagement in a very particular way. So we want students to see that many of the experiences or sentiments that they're having are shared by people in different places whom they've never met. And the result we hope is to build a sense of connection and togetherness through um, this period of intense isolation. From the development side, it's important to know that our data management plan, our file storage, privacy policies, and consent forms were all designed with accessibility and ethics of care in mind. We incorporated student, parent, and educator feedback. We offer a Spanish translation of the submission documents, and the film and visual submissions include captioning and alt text. Here you'll see how we receive the pieces. Click here leads to a document that's both a submission and a consent form which includes fields for basic location data. That's connected to Tableau's visual analytic software to produce an interactive map showing the location of contributors. And future iterations of the site will continue to build out the interactive features of the mapping interface. We do have three student pieces to share with you today. The first is from a student here in New York who is responding to the question, what has virtual or remote learning been like for you? And he says, it's been very bad. Um, a sentiment that many of us can certainly share, which is an important point, but there's a larger point of relevance, which is that in the first stages of the project and throughout, we had three student co-creators who ranged in age from 12 to 17, and we learned a lot from them. But one key theme that emerged early and continued was that they feel as though the adults in their lives right now are not hearing them or listening to them often, that they're thinking somehow kids are not as affected by all that's going on or magically more resilient, that they're told to keep working and keep their grades up and somehow sort of keep happy. But the question then becomes, what are we not hearing? Because we have to listen to them. And for many, it's been very bad. Here's another piece of visual art submission from Julian in Arlington, Virginia. He responds to the question about something that's brought him happiness through the pandemic. And he's recognizing the heroism of the medical professionals who have sustained, sustained us all. And as you can see, these kids are, are paying attention. And the final piece of student work we'll show you is actually a screenshot of a video from Andrea in Lima, Peru. And in it, she describes what it meant for her to get a dog during the early months of quarantine, which does seem to be a pretty widely shared experience. And here you can see how it crosses borders, which made it kind of wonderful and fitting that this was our first international submission. I want to conclude by thanking our team. I learned so much from each person of our group and genuinely enjoyed every aspect of our work together. But at a, the level of concrete project outcomes and impact, the skills that were combined in our group 
were what led to the distinguishing contributions of this project. And in that way, we really embody a core DH value in terms of how truly collaborative work leads to a final product that's greater what, than what any of us alone could have done. So it's been really, really meaningful and fun to be a part of. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next presentation is from the Freedom of Speech Project. All right, everyone can see my screen. Cool. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Kevin and today I am presenting on behalf of the Freedom of Speech Project. So as the US comes to terms with politics in the internet age, white nationalist uprisings, critiques of quote unquote cancel culture and more, a baseline literacy and understanding of the freedom of speech becomes increasingly important. And so the US is left with the question that this project is built to answer. What does freedom of speech really mean? There is a difference between how simply freedom of speech is worded in the constitution, as opposed to the complicated ways it actually plays out in case law. And so our project tries to make first amendment case law more accessible and understandable with data visualizations that illustrate the spatial dimensions of Supreme Court verdicts, since legal language is largely inaccessible for those without a background in law, which could include high school and college students. Um, and you might notice our two fun mascots here who encapsulate the motive behind our project where Gavel Gavin here represents the seeming simplicity of how the freedom of speech is worded in the constitution. While Asterisk would say something like, actually, it's not so simple if you take a look at the case law. So as such, our two mascots here represent these contradictions that our project attempts to clarify. So through the rest of this presentation, I'll be giving a very brief overview of our project's web experience specifically three modes of exploration. One, exploring by topic, two, exploring by map and timeline, and three, the guided experience by era. So from the homepage, users can condense their field of vision and learn more about a specific landmark case in a modal format like here. Um, in these pages, users can see whether speech was protected or not in this particular case and how that decision played out. So starting from the homepage, you'll notice that there are two ways of getting started. So one, exploring by topic, or two, exploring the map and timeline. So if a user decides to explore by topic, um, they're presented with a familiar UX. So there's a left-hand sidebar with filters, sorting mechanism at the top, and a stream of cases front and center that the user can click through to learn more. Uh, and then each case may be tagged with a courthouse in the bottom left, which indicates if it was a landmark case and or a gavel gavin on the right, if speech was protected. Um, the cases are also tagged with their most prevalent topic at the bottom with a corresponding percentage which communicates how devoted a topic is to that case. So for example, in the first case here, 63.9% of this case is devoted to the topic of obscenity. And this case is specifically about showing the allegedly, about the showing of allegedly obscene films. Um, and this percentage was comp computed with an algorithm that works best for more obvious topics, but is less successful with nuance. Um, and so if you notice a discrepancy between a case's topic percentage and the content itself, right? We mention it in our about page that you can contact us and leave feedback if you'd like. So yeah, that's exploring by topic. And then on the other hand, our map and timeline experience provides a more novel experience where the user can select cases by either clicking on the mounts on the map or nodes on the timeline. So when a user hovers over either, the corresponding mallet or timeline node will also highlight, which draws a visual connection between the case's spatial and temporal dimensions. Um, and then a user can select the case, a pop-up will appear here, and they can it'll lead them to learn more. But embedded within the maps and timeline experience is one of my favorite features, um, which is a third mode of exploration that we call our guided era exploration, which the user can turn on using this toggle in the bottom left. Um, this experience communicates and visualizes the investments of a particular historical time frame through eras, which are shown by the blue rectangles down here. Um, so for example, one era between the 50s and 60s that we fleshed out is called Race Matters and Better Red Than Dead, um, an era that we found to be invested in questions of race and communist politics in particular. Um, and this era's description reads, the 50s and beginning of the 60s see clear attacks on the NAACP in Alabama and Virginia which attempts to bar the organization from conducting business and litigation on formal grounds. Um, the House Committee on Un-American Activities is in full swing 
attempting to root out subversive activities by digging through membership records of the Communist Party. So what this era exploration mode does is allow users to think about like the where, what, how, and why of free speech in a particular historical context. Um, in the case of the era I've outlined here, some questions that it may prompt could include, how did the cases in this era relate to the rise of particular social movements during this time? How might these cases have structured the conversations between certain people and groups surrounding structural racism, radical politics, and the state? Um, so what is really great about this feature is that it provides a contextualized narrative that users can grab onto in order to make their own connections, um, which I think really encapsulates the motive behind our project. So yeah, please feel free to check out our website with the link, which we'll share in the chat, as well as our GitHub repo, which has all our code and readme file so that you can get an idea of how we built our project. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And lastly, of course, I didn't do this alone. We had a mighty team of four. Um, Joanne and Ava were our developers, data analysts and researchers. I was a UI UX lead and Martin was our project manager, manager outreach coordinator and researcher. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. We'll now hear from the Mapping Cemeteries team. Hello, my name is Brianna and I'm presenting Mapping Cemeteries on behalf of my team, which includes Lisa, Nadia, Lane, and Asma. Mapping Cemeteries is a digital humanist timeline and mapping project that explores the deathscapes across New York City. We understand a deathscape to encompass both physical and notional spaces, recognizing all acts of care pertaining to death and memorialization. We're using a historical and necropolitical lens to understand the city's deathscapes and asking the fundamental question of who gets to be remembered. What role does the city play in determining how people die and who is remembered? We're also using an infrastructural lens acknowledging that infrastructure can enhance, but also necessarily limits how people can interact with it. So we wanna try and understand how city policies and definitions of space affect our lived experiences of the city. The definitions you see here are representative of our educational approach that we've taken for our social media campaigns. Please, uh, please see more on our Instagram and Facebook pages. So why mapping and why cemeteries? Cemeteries offer an interesting perspective through which we can study New York City history. They provide evidence of changing traditions and practices of care. And we think there's more of an immediacy and intimacy in the connections we have with these spaces as they are so tied to people compared with other types of infrastructure and architecture. Mapping is a tool through which we examine places and their relationships to one another. We also use maps to help us find our location within the spaces around us but mapping always leaves something out. So we're trying to create a map that reveals aspects of the deathscape that have been hidden or overlooked. To allow the most room for exploration, we've limited the first phase of our project to a proof of concept examining five different types of cemetery and memorial spaces. A cemetery space that has been redeveloped, a historical cemetery that resisted redevelopment, a cemetery space that was redeveloped but is now a cemetery again, a war memorial, and hidden spaces of memorialization. Here's a preview of our GitHub page. As you can see, we've started with a map. One of the ways we thought we could add in layers and foreground aspects that are otherwise hidden on the map is through an exploration of timelines. On our horizontal timeline, we're trying to understand the history of our select locations within the broader history of the city. And here in the vertical timeline, we're exploring the many ways in which we've discovered connections between our locations. We've even created a tagging scheme to put our locations into conversation with one another. We explore the data behind our timelines even further in our limited audio series, Mapping Cemeteries Afterlife. Our first episode debuted today. So please check us out on SoundCloud. We very much embrace the DH value of openness and transparency. So we've also created a companion website on the CUNY Academic Commons. We recognize that one of our primary audiences is future Praxis students and new DH practitioners. So we've documented the entire process of building this project. And we want people to share in this journey with us. We've enabled commenting on our blog posts 
And we've highlighted readings we found interesting during the building of this project, which we share by hypothesis for collective annotating. So please read along and annotate with us. For so much more about mapping cemeteries in all of our research, please check us out on GitHub in the Commons and on social media. And I just wanna give a huge shout out to my team, Lisa, Nadia, Lane, and Asma, without whom this project would never have been possible. And we also wanna give a big thank you to everyone who has so generously supported us throughout this project. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Bree, thank you. Our fourth presentation is from the New York City Community Fridge Archive. Good evening, everyone. I'm Elena Bumrad, and I'm presenting on behalf. So first of all, you might be wondering, what is a community fridge? Well, it's what you see in the picture. It's a regular fridge. It's just on the sidewalk, and anyone can take whatever they want. So in the spring of 2020, at the height of the COVID-19 emergency, local communities started setting up these fridges in front of grocery stores, delis, and restaurants. The point is that anyone can take what they need and live where neighbors are just helping their neighbors. This is a great opportunity to fight food waste and provide free food to those in need. As of today, there are about 120 community fridges in the New York City metro area. And the one you see here is the Corona Comunidad fridge. So the community fridges are a decentralized initiative, meaning that there is no central organization that manages the fridges. Every community organizes on, it, on their own. This is a challenge because there isn't one website where people can find information, photographs, and links about all of the fridges. And that's where our archive comes in. The New York City Community Fridge Archive is a website built with the open source software Omeka through the were very important to us. Um, we were allowed to create an interactive map of the fridges, which you can see here. We allowed people to contribute to the archive and we decided to have a dedicated space for oral history. Following the motto, nothing about us without us, the team decided that our first goal was to involve the fridge community in every step of the process. We did so by inviting fridge organizers and volunteers to our team meetings, seeing the archive and collect feedback once we started building it. The purpose of the archive is to preserve and share the memory of the community fridges in New York City and serve as a repository of historical information about the COVID-19 emergency in New York. We hope that through the information contained in the archive, New Yorkers might feel inspired to start their own mutual aid initiatives around food sovereignty. And finally, we want to let the members of the Fridge community tell their stories in their own voice. We ask them to share the good, the bad, and the ugly, and not to shy away from sharing also their daily challenges and uh, uh, the advice that they have for other people that might want to organize their own fridge. Our archive is open for contributions, which means that anyone can share text, photos, audio recordings, and PDFs on our contributions page. Our contributions campaign started with follow-ups with our stakeholders. We emailed the fridge organizers we had consulted with and we let them know that the contributions page was open. We also had a strong social media campaign, which included a tutorial to show people how to contribute and an email blast. We are currently offering technical support to our contributors, helping them upload their materials, troubleshoot their problems and answering our quest their questions. While we wait until after the end of the semester for a more detailed analysis of the impact of our archive, this is some of the feedback we have gotten so far. As you can see from these messages, fridge organizers and volunteers have said that the archive reminds them that they are part of a larger community. They also think that it provides a map both for people in need and for people who might want to help locally. Another beautiful thought that one of the fridge organizers shared with us is that the archive will contribute to her legacy for her son. 
We believe that this kind of digital humanities initiative could be a roadmap for other practitioners and even for the local communities, uh, because it's an example of how an archive or a digital project can work with local communities at every step of the project. And now meet our team, a big shout out to all of my team. You can find us on Instagram at Community Fridge Archive and don't forget to visit our website. I also want to point out that all of the images and the testimonials you've seen in this presentation are contributions from our archives. So if you walk around the city and see a community fridge, consider taking a picture and uploading it to the archive. It will become part of history. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I'll certainly take you up on that advice. Our final presentation from the Praxis Seminar comes from the Reading Rebus Project. Hi, y'all. So we are the Reading Rebus team. This is going to be a quick introduction to our project. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about what a Rebus is, why rebuses are relevant to you, um, why we as a team care about rebuses so much, and then we'll conclude with a quick overview of the site itself. That's cool. Let's begin. So what is a rebus? Um, in the most commonly used definition, a rebus is a word puzzle where an image replaces part or whole of a word and sometimes even phrases like in this example to my left here in a farmer's love letter. We can do this one together. It's not hard. Um, so do you care it all for me for my heart beats for you. Um, and as this example, care it is care at and beats is beat, so that's more of a one for one word substitution. Um, and you probably are getting the hang of it already, right? And it might look a little bit familiar to you if you've ever sent an emoji as a text message and replaced a word for, um, with, for that emoji. So some other fun facts about the rebus, they often appear in print and they're also found on physical objects like plates, lighters even, and fans like hand fans. Though we found um, rebuses from many eras and cultures all over the world, there was definite rise to prominence in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, in Europe and the Americas. And so that's where we chose to focus the project. So why explore rebuses digitally? Well, for starters, puzzles are fun and fun is important. And if I don't get that out of my system, I explode. Um, but in all seriousness, the Rebus puzzle um, was used as a form of communication for some. When, uh, we, you could send a quick postcard as a Rebus or an elaborate love letter. Those are some of the things that we've encountered. Um, the Rebus has also been used as a language learning aid, which is why you'll see some Rebuses for children in our collection. Rebuses were also created uh, by many notable his, and historical and literary figures such as Longfellow and Twain, Phyllis Wheatley Peters, and even Leonardo da Vinci. And one of my favorite things to discover about rebuses entirely is that they've been used as political satire and even reporting. Um, very fun. Now, previously I mentioned, mentioned that the uh, rebus was pervasive in the area of in the era of print, 18th and 19th centuries, but possibly as a result of that, there's not a lot of digital representation of this puzzle and certainly not to the level of other such word puzzles like a crossword say. Um, so we found this curious given the graphical nature of, of the word puzzle and it just seems to be uh, crying out to be digitized. So we found that reading Rebus as a project is a, our first attempt of an ongoing process of both exploring the history of the Rebus as well as uh, beginning to play with some fun digital interactivity for the form because fun is important. So as a team, we have a variety of interests that converge a bit on the rebus, including, but absolutely not limited to, literature, semiotics, literacy, game studies, early modern history, visual art, and of course, archival. And I need to mention this because in true digital humanist form, we merged these interests and skills around our subject. I think this was a super awesome strength for our research oriented group because we were able to consider our source materials, reach out to our networks for guidance, um, and even like create a UI and a UX that was both playful while 
playing to the rebus form itself. So um, with that in mind, why don't we just take a look at it? So this is how you will find your first rebus. You can come to uh, our categories page. And this is my favorite category I mentioned previously, the satire category. Um, you can look at any one of these categories at the top here, like heraldry, which is where you'll find several rebuses, greeting cards, as I mentioned, or you could just go to all um, or to this URL at the bottom of the page to just kind of get maximum rebus effect. Um, and once you click on any of these rebuses, we can go deeper into it. Um, and you'll see our Rebus description page. So as you can see, as you hover over the individual images, you'll get the word that that image represents. Um, and to the right, you'll see all the metadata and the description of the Rebus itself. Um, and at the end here, you'll see that you can hover over the right um, area here and get a full answer should you so choose um, or you can also contribute a translation because we we don't know everything maybe there's a there's a better version that you have so that is our rebus and this is our project i hope you've enjoyed the tour and i just want to give a big ups to my team their true squad you can visit <laughs> you can visit our site at readingrebus.com and follow us on instagram and twitter um, with reading rebus thank you Such great projects and, and having seen some of these projects get started in the first semester uh, last year, it's just amazing to see what you all have done. And for anyone who's watching, these, these projects, these are, these are created by students uh, from nothing, from scratch, from concept to prototype uh, in, this, in one semester. So huge congratulations to all, all students working on these amazing projects. Hey, Prom, do we want to start up our slide deck for the remainder of the presentation? And as Prom is getting things set up, um, I'll just give you a quick overview. Hello, my name is Letha Rohde. I'm the Deputy Director of Digital Initiatives at the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, I'm so fortunate to have had the opportunity to watch so many of these projects as they have evolved over the semester, but I also have the incredible privilege of getting to work with the GC Digital Fellows, many of whom many of the people on this call are familiar with for good reason. They do so much important work across the Graduate Center. I'm going to do a quick introduction of them, but I also want to give you a preview that after the Digital Fellows talk about their work, we're going to have a number of graduate students from across um, CUNY talk about their work as well. So hang on for those. So very quickly, um, the Digital Fellows are the future, I think, of leadership inside and outside of academe. During the fellowship, the Digital Fellows learns important skills like um, budgeting, they learn about project management, they learn about leadership among their peers, they work both horizontally and vertically across the institution with students, teaching them how to integrate digital methods into their, um, their coursework, into their teaching. They do this through workshops, they do this through the Digital Research Institute, through one-on-one -on -one consultations, through developing tutorials and guides, events, all kinds of things, which they're gonna tell you a little bit about. But what they won't say about themselves is how enormously generous they are with their time, their effort, their thoughtfulness. When Kathleen Fitzpatrick talks about generous thinking, I think about the fact that in the hands of people like the Digital Fellows, the future of academe is quite bright because these are fellows who spend their time thinking about what the future of the Graduate Center and its use and integration of technology should really look like and how much we have to offer. And so this group of really unique eight doctoral students have spent so much time this semester pivoting towards the online environment. They've run a digital research institute that they used to happen in person over an intense week to a six, uh, five week experience that happened virtually online. And they've worked with incredible numbers of students teaching them digital coding skills over Zoom. And if you haven't ever tried it, if you haven't ever taught your mom, for example, how to use technology over Zoom, then you have some sense of how challenging this can be. But the fellows do this every single week of, the, of every single semester with a smile on their face and increasing enthusiasm 
telling me that they've spent an hour or two even online in digital in working groups or consultations helping students to achieve their research goals, even when the library is closed and the students feel like they're not able to get to archives and things like that. The digital fellows do everything they can to make sure that the other students on campus are able to move their work forward. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to them to talk about the incredible work they've done this year. Hello everyone, my name is Philippa. I'm a GC digital fellow. And today I'll be talking about the Digital Research Institute, also known as the DRI. So this year between January 29th and February 27th, the Digital Fellows ran their annual DRI, which teaches foundational skills for doing digital research as a remote workshop series. The goal of the DRI is to equip participants with basic skills to be able to learn on their own and to begin to develop their own digital projects. For this iteration of the Institute, we transformed our usual in-person four-day event into a series of workshops held remotely over five weekends. Each Saturday, 28 participants from 18 different programs at the GC joined us to take workshops about the command line, data literacies, the Python and R programming languages, text analysis, data analysis, and project development. Uh, next slide, Brom. Bringing our DRI curriculum to an online environment, we tried to facilitate the kind of collective and supportive learning that we prioritize in our face-to-face -face ses sessions. First, to create a sense of community, we opened an online workspace that offers students a platform for discussion. We also split up our participants into teams to replicate the small table atmosphere of our in-person workshops. Then, when we began teaching the workshops, we shifted our pedagogical approach to make the most out of, of our participants' attention spans online. We offered a combination of asynchronous and synchronous spaces and instructions to give participants a more flexible and fuller access to the curriculum. During synchronous instruction, we created dedicated time blocks for demonstration, practice, and group work. These small adjustments to our pedagogical approach help to recreate the slow, cumulative, and personal approach that is ideal for teaching technological concepts to beginners. To learn more about this year's institute, check out our Digital Fellows blog for some guest blog posts from this year's DRI participants who explain firsthand their experience. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name my name is Yu Xiaolo. I'm a digital fellow at the GC Digital Initiatives, and I'm representing the cohort of Data for the Public 2020 to give this short speech. Next slide. So we were a group of MA and PhD students at the CUNY GC Graduate Center. We all come from different backgrounds and study different disciplines. In the Data for Public Good project, we're using data for public benefits by applying tools and techniques that are generally used in business applications. For me, I had a chance of being a group member and participating in a team to complete the project. This is also something that I, I can add to my resume in the project experience. Moreover, it also improves my collaborative capability that we work through different problems by having the weekly meetings and constant interactions with each other. Next slide, please. So during the 2020, uh, we focused on COVID-19's impact on CUNY students based on our common interest and concern. We gathered data from seven sources, including CUNY departments, government agencies, and other organizations. We conducted multidimensional analysis of the pandemic's impact on house composition, caretaking, technology access, et cetera. We also identified some unusual patterns and made preliminary predictions. The full report has been posted on our, app, our website, and I highly recommend you to take a look at it. Next slide, please. And this year, the Data for Public Good group is partnering with a volunteer organization, the Racial Data Checker, which is providing data for national and local organizations, as well as research agencies worldwide. This collaboration with the outside agencies adds more value and some real world experience to the Data for Public Good project. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rafa. I've been leading the Python Users Group, PUG, uh, for the past three years, and it's been a very exciting journey. Um, for this presentation, I, I, 
I put like a, a little bit of a seven errors game. So make sure to pay attention to what's going on in the picture, especially people's hair and facial hair. Um, this was two years ago. And now, um, Peron, can you please pass to the next slide? All right. Okay, this is how we are now. Um, uh, so for people who don't know, Pug is a group of Python users. And the idea since the beginning was to build community around, <laughs> Steve is complaining in the, in the chat already, um, build a community around Python users. And it kind of also became a huge uh, support for beginners who are trying to learn Python. Uh, and programming languages, one of the hardest things, maybe the harder thing, is to just stay and not give up. And learning to program can be a very lonely experience. So having Pug over there really helps people in this moment of their journey. So whenever we teach a introduction to Python workshop, we try to bring them to Pug because we, we have like a kind of a welcoming atmosphere, very beginner oriented. It's just a place that people can just ask simple questions that would maybe take you like hours and hours to solve. And now you can get to see other people doing it. Um, and we always try to make it as informal as possible. And like we, we, we like to try things right there. So very experimental, we do different things. We are uh, always working together on some things. Last fall, we were doing data analysis together, just like having a random project and people asking questions right there. So people could get to see us that have a little bit more time with Python, see how we also uh, get a lot of errors, how we also struggle, how we are finding solutions right there. Uh, creating this like, so even to de demystifying how like learning to program is. Um, and I think the, the biggest um, proof for me that the bug works and is good is that people just keep coming. And it was always surprising for me. Uh, two years ago, we made a poll to see the best day of the week and people voted for Friday. And I was like, this is a wrong, this is a bad idea. Nobody's gonna come. Friday, everybody's tired. They wanna have a beer. And then people would just come. And then when the, the pandemic started, same. I was like, there's no chance people will come to this because after a whole week of being in Zoom calls, the last thing you want to do is be in another Zoom call. And then people keep coming. And that's that just amazes me every single week. So uh, I, I'm thrilled to be part of this. I'm happy that I, I was able to participate on this. And I'm probably living this. So I'm uh, even sentimental about it. But yeah, if you're not part of Pug, please come, please join us. It's always fun and very gratifying. Thank you. Howdy, uh, my name's Connor. I'm a, so I'm a PhD candidate in biology and a GC digital fellow. And sadly this year was my last as a digital fellow and therefore my last as a leader of uh, the R user group. So the R user group serves as a community for those interested in the R statistical coding environment. And during my tenure, we went from meeting in person and sharing snacks, drinks, and laughs to meeting over Zoom and consuming our own snacks and drinks, but still sharing a few laughs. And RUG members uh, this last year came from a variety of backgrounds with active participants from eight departments. And to better serve the variety of backgrounds of our members and kind of keep things interesting while we're uh, remote, I uh, implemented these theme series addressing specific topics like machine learning, geographic information systems, and text analysis. And we had a lot of fun, uh, not only learning about the different topics, but discussing how each of us applies them in our own uh, R projects and research projects. And one of the major pains of going remote was like troubleshooting installations and errors over video calls. We couldn't just like scoot over to each other's computers to see what's wrong. And so we migrated to the cloud and moving to a cloud-based uh, coding environment allowed us to get to the interesting topics quicker. I was 
the only person who needed to install software and the rug admins uh, could view other members coding environments to help troubleshoot problems they had. So it made things a lot simpler. And it's an exciting step forward in making coding more accessible for uh, GC uh, users. And although I'm sad to leave, uh, I see that our user group is my legacy with the fellows and I can't wait to see where the new cohort takes us and I will be lurking in joining future meetings. So I hope to see more folks join and learn about the exciting world of R. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stefano Morello. Uh, the slides are going a little bit too fast, I think. Um, Rom, can you go back to? Thank you. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate in English, and this is my third and last year as a GC Digital Fellow. Among other duties uh, for the past couple of years, uh, I've been co-leading uh, with Filippa, uh, the uh, Digital Archive Research Collective, also known as DARC, uh, one of the working groups ran by the Digital Fellows. DARC got started when I was working on my own uh, project at the East Bay Punk Digital Archive, um, uh, which I developed over the course of my tenure as a Digital Fellow. And aside from building a set of technical skills and developing my project, uh, um, sorry, developing my project also involves familiarizing with archival theory and practice, as well as uh, familiarizing with the rich ecosystem of librarians, faculty, and fellow grad students at the Grad Center, uh, working on digital archives in different forms and shapes. Uh, after chatting with members of the community about um, their needs and desires uh, in terms of what what, what the, I asked them, what they uh, what they felt like uh, the GC digital community lacked in terms of uh, support to develop digital archives. Uh, I, I talked to Lisa and, and we decided to try and spearhead the, uh, this platform to put different constituencies in conversation. And so last year, the working group um, uh, of whom are also part, uh, Paramash Mera and D. Uh, organized an event series at the GC, and we created a wiki with information about institutional resources, featured projects, and overviews of several digital archival methods, approaches, and tools. Uh, we also began hosting monthly informal meetings, um, open uh, to members of, of the community of all skill levels, disciplines, and backgrounds. In the 2020 and 2021 academic year, DARC has tailored its virtual programming on the, uh, on the needs of students who have seen the research plans disrupted by the pandemic. In the fall, our monthly meetings focused on strategizing and addressing some of the issues that we were facing as the pandemic has, uh, has prevented us from accessing the archives we intended to visit. And in, in that context, we explore themes such as remote access to resources, and we shared best practices and ways to build the human relationships with archivists and librarians remotely, as well as, well as uh, we shared resources with fellow researchers. Um, in the spring, we also held uh, open meetings. Rather than focusing our conversations on predetermined themes, we just treated those spaces as a place to congregate and discuss interesting projects that members of the community came across, brainstorm solutions to theoretical or technical issues, present and discuss student projects or classroom experiences with digital archives. And we also hosted conversations around relevant issues that concern digital archives across the field. Uh, and one more thing that's not dark related, um, over the past three years, I have spoken and written at length about how GCDI and being a digital fellow has been a game changer uh, for me, for my academic career. But since this is my last official event as a digital fellow at the GC, uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Matt and Lisa for the many opportunities and the support they provided over the past three years. And I also want to thank all the current and past digital fellows from whom I've learned so much. And in addition to the technical, to the technical skills that I've learned, GCDI has really showed me and taught me that a sustainable and collaborative mode of engaging with academia is indeed possible. And I, I hope to carry uh, a bit of that with me um, wherever I go.
Thank you so much, Stefano. We are going to miss everyone. I dropped a few statistics about this year's cohort. We have five folks that I think Matt mentioned earlier who are cycling off of our team of eight, which is a slightly smaller group um, this year, and they had a big task ahead of them. And among the three of them, I believe what I've been able to figure out is that they have started two, at least two new working groups, the R working group and the um, dark. Uh, they have developed something like uh, three new workshops each, which meant about 15 new workshops, 20 blog posts and tutorials, not to mention countless hours of open office hours and consultations with faculty, students, and staff. So we're just very grateful to them. And thank you so much for all the work that you've done. So we're moving on now to student projects. And I believe you all know what the order is. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Palmer, and I work as the senior CLT and adjunct faculty at LaGuardia, and I'm a master's student here in digital humanities. Next slide, please. I, because a lot of the classes in communication studies have a language linguistics component to them. We have a few in particular, communication for the non-native speaker and voice and diction that are specifically about linguistics. And we also have speech pathology courses. And this comes up in public speaking and a few other classes. And the reality is there are a lot of linguistic sites out on the web, but none of them fit our needs. Like I think the University of Texas and Iowa both have magnificent linguistics websites, but they're general linguistic websites. And the University of Pennsylvania has a great website on the dialects of American English, but that's not what we need. So as a result, over since last summer, I have been developing this website. It isn't complete yet. It's a work in progress, but there's a lot of information on there. I've put the, um, the website itself, the URL here on, on the PowerPoint. So that you can so that you can see the oat, but I'm going to give you just one particular little piece of it. Next slide, please. This is part of the pronunciation. These are this is the consonant sounds of American English. The sound I have circled right here is one of one of the sounds we call the th sound. This is the sound in the word this. So what happens, this is the International Phonetic Alphabet symbol. If you take one of our courses like um, Voice and Diction or Communication for the Non-Native Speaker, you learn the IPA. And there are sample words. And then this is a sample of me repeating each one of the sample words twice. So you can hear it as well as see it because you can't actually pronounce the sound if you can't hear it first. And with the TH sounds in particular, that's difficult because they're not in a lot of other languages. So a lot of people, instead of saying mother, would substitute that TH for like a Z or something. This website also includes things like the anatomy of speaking from how it, it, it involves with breathing and everything else up through word stress, which is an incredibly complicated phenomenon in English. And, um, and I am working on putting up intonation. And thank you for watching. Hello, everyone. I'm Emily Monum, and our project, the New York City Community Fridge Archive Oral History Project, is a satellite project of the New York City Community Fridge Archive, which you already learned about. And this project came about through Professor Arantxa Borchero's digital memories course this semester. The goal of this project is to create more curated additions to the archive through the oral histories of individuals interacting with community fridges on a day-to-day -day basis. These individuals include fridge organizers, fridge volunteers, shoppers from the local community, and donators who are individuals or organizers donating food and supplies to these fridges. Next slide, please. We created a list of questions to ask in order to explore how these individuals see themselves within this movement and how they believe their fridges have impacted their local communities. 
So far, we have conducted four interviews with individuals that are both organizers and volunteers. All these interviews have been conducted over Zoom, and we utilize the record function in order to save the audio and transcripts of these interviews. We then uploaded them. Um, the up, we uploaded the audio files to SoundCloud where they are stored and then linked into the oral history metadata synchronizer for further create, curation, which Emily Pagano will speak more about. Next slide, please. Thanks. <clears throat> so yeah, we're using the OMS plugin for Omeka, the oral history metadata synchronizer, um, which if you're not familiar is an open source web-based system for enhancing access to oral histories online. Um, so OMS is used in two parts, the application and the viewer. The interviews, as Emily mentioned, are audio only. They will be prepared for access using the OMS application to create item level metadata, which it'll include basic things like title, um, names of interviewees, although we will also keep it anonymous if they prefer their roles, the neighborhood or refrigerator being referenced, audio length, etc. The OMS app also allows us to do time-coded indexing where we tag each interview with descriptions at pertinent times within the recording. Listeners will be able to skip around in the interview to parts that interest them or parts that they want to listen to again. And this is what you see on the screen now. This is a screenshot of an indexed interview in OMS. So you can see, for example, minute 13 and 31 seconds was described showing that this spot in the interview is where our participant described her personal life and how it motivated her to become involved with community fridges. Um, the work in OMS in the OMS app will result in an XML file that can be uploaded using the OMS viewer, which is embedded in the existing community fridge archive website. Um, the viewer will allow users to see interview metadata, transcripts, as well as the indexed interview itself, similar to what you're seeing here. Users will be able to explore these interviews along with the rest of the New York City community fridge archive, all of which together will offer a well-rounded perspective on the community fridge movement in New York City with a focus on its importance during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have a link that I think Emily just shared in the chat to our interviews in SoundCloud. So these are not fully integrated into our website yet, but they are here for everyone to check out in the meantime. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Elizabeth and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share some of my work with you guys today. Uh, so basically what I did is I built a supervised machine learning model that is able to predict whether or not a character in a Spanish word should have a diacritic. Hence the title Spanish diacritic restoration. So for example, if you have a text file with an input sentence like the one you see on the screen, which has no diacritics, the model should be able to give you an output in which all the characters in red are correctly diacriticized. Now, what makes this task tricky is the fact that the model will have to be able to disambiguate certain words that can appear either with or without a diacritic, which would be considered a meiza. So esta in the sentence above is an example of a meiza because it means this when it appears without a diacritic and then is when it appears with one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the system that I designed is hybrid in the sense that it consists of three parts. The first part is a dictionary consisting of a set of words that always appear with diacritics, like Nina girl, which I built by scraping through about four corpora. The second part consists of a set of about 10 handwritten grammar rules. And the third consists of a set of classifiers that should be able to disambiguate meizas and correctly diacriticize them. So for example, the model would take an input sentence like the one you see on the slide and then iterate through each of the words starting with esta. Esta would then be sifted through each of the parts of the system until it got to the classifiers section. At this point, the model would then perform a series of calculations based on the naive Bayes algorithm, and then ultimately decide to leave the word as is. Um, so that's just a preview of how it would work, but it would do the same thing for every word in the sentence. 
Next slide, please. So overall, the system is able to correctly diacriticize approximately 96% of all tokens, which is pretty impressive considering how simple these classifiers are. Uh, an error analysis reveals that most errors surface from a failed dictionary lookup of invariantly diacriticized tokens, like película or movie. So for example, if you have an input like agarra el pañal, the model will do fine with the first two words, including the melliza el, which is supposed to be the tricky part, but surprisingly, it will struggle with a word like bañal because the word didn't appear in any of the four corpora that I scraped through in order, in order to build the dictionary. So to me, the solution is to lessen the model's dependency on this dictionary. So my first plan, plan A, is to build a new classifier that determines whether or not the vowels within a word should be diacriticized. Um, ultimately, I'm really unsure of whether this will yield a significant improvement, but it would be interesting to see if the model is able to pick up on certain generalizations that up to this point are unknown to me. So, um, and then plan B is really just to build a neural network. And so uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, everyone. My name is Silvia Rivera Alfaro, and I am a student at the Latin American, Iberian, and Latino Cultures program. When I was about to start my master's dissertation on the non sexist language policy at my university in Costa Rica, the man who was the chair of the program I was part of told me, be careful not to become a feminist. And after that, I faced the question of why I was choosing to study a feminist language policy numerous times by many different people in the Hispanic uh, linguistic community. This is only an example of some of the reasons why within Spanish linguistics, there has not been room for feminist linguistics uh, to be properly recognized as a field. In 2018, I met Ernesto Cuba, uh, who is also a student at LILAC and had similar experiences in Peru as the author of the non-sexist language guidelines for the government. We started to learn together about the subject and to look for solutions. And as a response, we created Indisciplinados in 2020. Indisciplinados is a Spanish speaking feminist linguistic circle with participants across the Americas and Europe with people from at least 10 different countries in Latin America. In Disciplinadex, is a Spanish-speaking feminist linguistic circle, as I said, and we, um, we are also a learning community and a research community. We, and I am using the we with a lot of happiness because this means a lot of people, as you will see later, we are learning um, about the work that other people are doing and the work that has been done previously. The community is mostly comprised by women and people from the LGBTQ community. We are not only from the academia, that's why we are undisciplined, and we are not only from linguistics. Uh, also, we are openly activists. Uh, we, for example, go to and protest in the streets in our countries and have experience with the feminist movement. Um, and we are activists also within the academia. That's why we are. Um, we think ourselves in, as an active uh, activist group. Um, and we are activists in the Hispanic linguistics and philology world, as you can imagine from my introduction. Our collective goal is to co-create a praxis based the colonial space built from our multiple local experiences about language and feminism. We meet bi-weekly to discuss research about gender, language, and sexuality, to share our work in progress in a non-hierarchical environment, and to invite high-level researchers and authors and activists of the region to present in the circle. Uh, the knowledge generated within the group is publicly available on our website, and we are looking uh, for other ways of uh, being a public facing community as our first editathon that will take place in July. And we are happily coordinating this event with different chapters of Wikimedia. And uh, next slide, please. 
Now I will share with you some experience of the digital tools we use to keep a synchronous and asynchronous conversation within our community and with a wider audience. Uh, for internal community communications, we have the mailing list with uh, 122 people, Slack uh, with a similar number of people, and the Facebook group with 488 members. Uh, not everyone is going to every session, but uh, we at least have different conversations. Uh, and we use the Google Docs for, Docs for creating uh, collective documents, such as the minutes of our sessions and notes of, on the readings. We still want to include annotating tools like uh, such as hypothesis, but it has not been successful uh, yet as an experience. Anyway, we are very happy with all the experience that we have creating this uh, collective notes on the readings and also because the slack space or the facebook group uh, help us to keep talking and building up in the different subjects uh, also to reach the public audience we have our online our website which includes a blog with multimodal mind notes of, of every session these mind notes are also of interest for the internal community to inform themselves about what we have talked about if they have not been in a in a session and the minutes include the names of the people who participated in the conversation as a way to, to make clear of, uh, our diversity and to include different perspectives. We have also a YouTube channel to share the videos of some of the sessions. We don't record every session. Especially, we record especially those with external visitors such as activists and authors. And we also have a Facebook page and an Instagram to promote our, our work. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to thank you for your attention. I really, really invite you to visit our website and social media. Thank you. Um, hello again, I'm Brianna Kazat in the MA in Digital Humanities program, and I'm presenting Digital Memory Project Reviews, um, a publication I've created using the CUNY instance of Manifold. Next slide, please. This semester, my fellow students and I wrote reviews of digital projects as part of our coursework in Dr. Aranzazu Borachero's Digital Memories Theory and Practice class. The pedagogical objectives included gaining knowledge of digital projects in the digital memories field and digital humanities more broadly, developing critical evaluation skills and demystifying how to build our own digital projects. We found Dr. Miriam Posner's How Did They Make That video to be extremely insightful in learning how to break down projects into multiple parts. The data that the project began with, the processes the project creators carried out on the data, and the way in which the final project was presented to the audience. In total, we wrote reviews for 28 different digital projects spanning multiple topics. We gained skills building teams in a remote learning environment, and we gained inspiration and confidence learning how our research endeavors can contribute to the field. Next slide, please. With the reviews written, ingesting them into Manifold, oh, don't play the video yet. Sorry, thanks. Um, with the reviews written, ingesting them into Manifold was my next step. Manifold is a publishing platform only, having and having learned that Manifold was built to understand HTML and Markdown language, I opted to translate all of our texts from Google and Word docs into Markdown to maintain control over the final presentation. I chose to ingest each, video, each review separately rather than compile them into one file. Okay, now you can play the video. This gave me more flexibility in my workflow and it means that each review has a unique URL, which means that we can all use them in our portfolios. A drawback to this approach is that I could not use Manifold's built-in table of contents function. However, having learned Markdown and having a specific URL for each review, I created my own custom thesaurus instead. In it, I've explored intersections and overlap between the projects we reviewed. My thesaurus also offers multiple points of access through which the audience can read our reviews. As we learned from Dr. Posner, all of our reviews begin by identifying the data, processes, and presentation of the project. We've also listed the digital tools used to build them, as well as the languages. To help contextualize our reviews and provide a visual record of the projects in case their sites stop working, 
I also chose to include a screenshot of each project's homepage, which I've attached to the review as a resource. I invite all of you to explore this publication further in Manifold. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Patricia and I'm in the MA and DH program and I'm going to briefly introduce you to my archival project, which I refer to as a critical archival provocation using cigarette cards produced in 1889 by Duke's Cigarettes. Um, cigarette cards were trading cards that were placed by tobacco companies in cigarette packages to serve as advertising to bourgeois consumers and also to add rigidity to packages. These collectible cards depicted the period's cultural norms and featured actresses, sports, travel, and more. The set you see here is titled Coins of All Nations, and they come from the NYPL Digital Collections, and they feature satirical caricatures of racial and ethnic stereotypes from 50 nations. They were meant to be humorous, but today I see them as dehumanizing and offensive, especially considering the imperialist and call colonist practices of the 19th century and the history of slave labor in the tobacco industry. Next slide, please. The project uses this specific collection of cigarette cards as a starting point to deeply look at other related publicly available materials at the NYPL digital collections, artifacts that aren't necessarily always seen or to see them in a new light. So I've created an interactive experience using blurring as a visual strategy to engage the viewer and create a difficult viewing experience because I believe that viewing these racial stereotypes are difficult. Um, and so the experience of viewing them should also be made difficult. Hovering over the images provides the viewer with the power to sharpen and make things clear. The goal is for the viewer to look more closely and contemplate the stereotypes and participate in their own knowledge production. Next slide, please. Clicking on a card will take you to my curated collection of publicly accessible archival material from the NYPL from the same place and time period of the card. Drawing visual connections with the other artifacts, I hope the viewer will question history, look carefully at the sources and contributing factors for the racial and ethnic stereotypes and see NYPL materials from a different perspective. In this example of China, there are visual examples of colonist imagery in postcards and photographs and drawings by Europeans and Americans of Chinese people from travel souvenir albums. The cultural moment we're currently experiencing offers opportunities for alternative archival practices that use <clears throat> reconstruction, subjectivity, ambiguity, and speculation to form new narratives <clears throat> and meaning. I will place the, the link to my project in the chat in case anyone is interested. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Biani. I'm a student in the Master's in Data Analysis and Visualization. And today I'm gonna to talk about my capstone project, which is about black women in the Ramans genre. And uh, the idea of this project is to create an application where users can find more information about black women who are in this genre and find more novels written by them. And it's a Python-based application that uses text analysis methods um, to highlight this, uh, to, to highlight this uh, women. And the application is based on results from an LDA topic modeling algorithm, which uses 393 complete novels written by 48 Black women authors. And I'm also going to be pasting the link later on. And if you go to the next slide, And this project was inspired by a text analysis methods class taught by Lisa Rohde, where there was a lot of emphasis on, on approaching text analysis methods using a feminist lens. And this is something that I heavily incorporated during the project. And also Black women in general are really underrepresented in the publishing industry. And when they are in the romance genre, their work is often discounted because of the negative reputation that follows the romance genre. And if you go to the next slide. Cool, and I'm just gonna give you a demo because it's best to just look at the app and see what it can do. And if you can play the video. 
Cool. So when you open the application, you're going to see a homepage where you can find information about how to use the tool. You can find books and get recommendations as well as learn about authors. And the book catalog, you're going to be asked to enter either um, an author name, a topic, or the year of publication. And once you filter by one of those uh, options, you're going to see a number of books that meet that criteria. And you can also show the book description so you can learn more about the book itself, like what is the plot, and also where to buy the book. And once you get a book that you are interested in, you can get recommendations of books that are similar to that one based on the topics, which is where the LDA comes from. You can either type or just select from the drop down menu for one of the books that you're interested in. And you're going to see a list of books that, are, that have some level of similarity um, to that one based on the topics. And this is something that you can adjust based on how similar you want the books to be. So 93 will be 93% similarity based on the topics. And if you want to go lower, so you can get a wider range. And you can also, again, get a list of the, what, it, what are the descriptions as well where to buy the book. And finally, there is an author spotlight where I really wanted to highlight the women behind these novels. And you can find information of each one of them. You can see their biography as well as a link to their website and the books that were featured during this project, as you can see in this demo. And the last part, um, I have a suggestion form, uh, which is a Google form right now. But you can add more suggestions about books that you want to see in this project or any authors that you want to see in this project. This is in no way an exhaustive, an exhaustive list, but it's something that I want to keep expanding. So any feedback, any suggestions uh, will be really appreciated. And that's all I have. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Dee and I'm also a GC Digital Fellow. Some of you might have attended my previous workshops on sound, recording, and audacity. And for my presentation today, I wanted to share how that comes into play with my teaching. So I teach history and systems of psychology at the College of Staten Island. And like many of you, I have been thinking about the online learning environment and how we might do better by our students. Hence, in planning out my classes for the fall and spring this academic year, I chose to replace conventional papers, tests, and exams with a semester-long group podcast project. Next slide, please. So while the incorporation of podcasts in the classroom isn't new, it has often stopped at just being, uh, as, at just being used as text replacements for course material. So we don't always think about having students produce podcast episodes. As Harris suggests, uh, podcast production allows students to learn how to engage with materials in ways that are more genuine to their everyday language, learn to translate knowledge often locked in ivory towers, and actively engage them as knowledge producers. Rather than writing just for the instructor of the class or taking tests and exams, students are now engaging with the materials more meaningfully and purposefully. Next slide, please. One important aspect of implementing podcast production in the classroom is to minimize technology barriers. In my case, I have assigned it as a group project to help spread the workload of producing an episode. For example, someone who, like, who would like to try podcast production may take on the challenge of being an editor and someone else might choose to take on script writing or the role of the narrator. To ensure that students are supported, I also created a list of resources on how to produce a podcast and several podcast examples for asynchronous learning. I've also dedicated class time throughout the semester to check in with groups one-on-one. -on -one. Dedicating class time in, uh, to check in is really important to help your students stay on task throughout the semester. Next slide, please. As an example, I am sharing how I've broken down the project across the semester and how I scaffolded the assignment to support students at each stage. For those who are interested in implementing this, I highly recommend that you incorporate L components where you have students submit draft recordings before the final episode to help them build confidence and familiarity with the process. As part of the course schedule, I also included a final listening party at the end of the semester for me that was this morning um, to have them share their podcast in class with their peers, providing them with a space to present their hard work, much like what we're doing right now in the digital showcase to more than just me, the instructor, 
uh, and also help build their confidence as knowledge translators and producers. And I really emphasize this role of being knowledge translator and knowledge producers because students oftentimes don't feel like they are producing knowledge, especially when they're just writing conventional papers or taking tests and exams. So um, if you're interested in implementing this in your class or other spaces, please feel free to check out the project guidelines. Um, I've pasted my project guideline um, in the chat. So feel free to use it in any capacity that you like. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, what an amazing set of presentations. Um, it makes me so proud to be part of this institution and part of this community to see uh, the, the commitment, the, the creativity, the power of all these projects together. Um, in, in closing this event, um, I want to start by, um, first of all, thanking uh, the the digital fellows who uh, do so much and the advising fellows who do so much to um, help uh, the students working on these projects. I also wanna thank Arantxa and Brett um, out of whose, and Lisa out of whose classes many of these projects came. Um, I wanna thank Lisa for her amazing work uh, advising the fellows um, and, and moving us all forward. Um, and I just want to end by pulling out a couple of threads that I saw across so many of these projects. Um, the first is, uh, you know, creativity. There, there was so much creativity on display today. Um, in the work, that the projects that you shared, you didn't just, you know, present something blandly. You really interrogated it. You thought about it. You chose platforms based on what they could do. And um, how people might interact with them. And that was just wonderful to see. Um, many of these projects also displayed a commitment to racial and social justice, which is so vital in this moment and vital in all moments, but especially this one. And uh, it just, it was incredible to see that in the project shared. Um, but then finally, I wanna talk about community uh, mutual aid um, inspired by the, by the Fridge Project and, and CARE. Um, which you know the students who were in the um, intro to digital humanities class in the in the fall, we talked a lot about care. And one thing that was just so evident to me here, watching you present, and especially watching you in the chat and watching you share emojis, cheering one another on. Uh, you know, you take such pleasure in each other's success, and you. Uh, acknowledge one another's work and you push each other forward. And it just makes this, you know, an incredible community to be a part of. I hope that all of you and, and so many of you, whether you're a digital fellow moving on um, or a student soon to graduate from one of our master's programs, I really hope you will stay involved in, in this community because it's a very special one. And um, just wanna thank everybody for what they, what they shared today and for what they've contributed. Uh, both in terms of their own projects, but really importantly, this year especially, how they've helped the others around them uh, grow and move forward. Thank you so much. Take care and have a good night.